Am I audible when I speak? Fine, yes, sir. Very well. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Is that here, boy? Oh, okay. <clears throat> Sir, you can start now. Okay, Anil, let's start. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. On behalf of Daily Liver Foundation, it is a proud privilege for me to welcome you to our new webinar on science and art of managing intestinal gas, belching, eructations, flatulence, hiccups. I am very privileged to have two most senior gastroenterologists with us, uh, Professor Rakesh Chandan, who was the head of the department of uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences and uh, now practicing as head of gastroenterology at PSRI in New Delhi, who was uh, incidentally my teacher and mentor, and Professor Rakesh Kochar, who is currently heading the department of PGI Chandigarh. In addition, we, today we have an elite panel of speakers with Dr. Shri Hari from Sir Gangaram Hospital, Dr. Naresh Bhatt from uh, Bangalore and Dr. S.K. Tyagi from uh, Meerut. The topic which we have chosen today is extremely common and it is a real problem in managing these common issues on day-to-day -day basis. The reason being the problem is very common. We are still not sure of the basic common etiopathological factors which are responsible for this. And since these factors are not easily discernible, we do not have good algorithms to manage this. So hopefully, with the present panel of moderators and speakers, we may be able to sort out some of the issues. With that, I'll hand over the proceedings to Professor Rakesh Tandon. Thank you, Anil. I think everybody should realize that gassy abdomen or intestinal gas, belching, these are about the commonest symptom with which patients come to us. And this is one problem where we know very little. And unfortunately, in the laity, the concept of gas is not very clear. Some people attribute it to acidity, some to bloating, some to constipation and associated discomfort in the abdomen. So you need to really take the history in detail as to, as to what the person means when they say that it is gassy abdomen. So this is a very apt, apt topic to deal with when Dr. Arora mentioned that to me. I say, well, that's great, but let's just organize it as to find out what is the pathogenesis of this? How do we objectively assess gas? And uh, then uh, what is the treatment for it? So this is all what we, is be going to be done by this uh, elite group of speakers that Dr. Arora has already mentioned. And it's a great pleasure for me to moderate this along with my colleague, Dr. Rakesh Kocha, who happens to be the head of gastroenterology at Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education Research in Chandigarh, and his uh, basic area is indeed luminal gastroenterology. With that, I think I'll just request Dr. Anil Arora, who is the chief of gastroenterology at the Institute of Gastroenterology and Liver Disease at Gangaram Hospital to uh, get the ball rolling. Anil? Yes, sir. Are my slides visible, sir? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, good evening, everybody. I am thankful to Professor Rakesh Tandon and Professor Rakesh Kochar for giving me this opportunity. What I'm going to present today in next 20 minutes is pathogenesis of intestinal gas, bloating, and hiccups. In fact, since time memorial, it has been known to the human being that if you want to blow a candle, it will get extinguished because it contains non-combustible gases. At the same time, human beings do to have a knowledge that the, once you have a flatus which is falling onto flame of the candle, it will only blow up further. But it was in late 80s and early, uh, early 1850s that you had this guy called Joseph Gillerton, who invented a new technique of executing the prisoners in a painless manner. So this was a machine which was, in, which was not invented by him, but he popularized this machine. And whenever you will chop off the head of this person, large amount of the gas under the water would come out. So that was the first indication in the history that there was some gas which is present in the human beings. If you want to read more about it, these are three books available free on internet, that is on Google, which tells you about the history of the gas. Major contribution came from this gentleman called Magindy in 1860, who hypothesized that the presence of the hydrogen and methane in the intestines of the guillotinized victims, which I just showed you how they were guillotinized by this new machine. Subsequently, in 1950s and 1970s, multiple cases of explosion of the colon during surgeries were reported when the surgeons were doing the cautery during the bleeding procedures. And finally, in 1979, uh, there were reports of explosion which had happened during endoscopic procedures. So why is it that this thing happens? Over a literature review of about uh, more than 50 years, there have been 20 cases of the explosion during procedures, of which 55% were during surgery and 45% were because of the colonoscopic induced cautery. Why does explosion occurs? Today we have sound basis of knowledge. The flatus contains, or the large intestine contains these two gases called hydrogen and methane. And whenever you have these two gases, in addition to at least 5% of the oxygen, and whenever you tend to do cautery or APC, there is going to be a blast. So a combination of hydrogen, methane in presence of 5% oxygen is going to trigger the colonic explosion. That is precisely the reason these cases were reported in 70s, 80s, and 90s, when mannitol was used as one of the agents for preparation of the bowel. Since mannitol and is a basically a sugar alcohol, it is partly fermented by the small intestine. And when it goes into the large intestine, it is acted upon by the bacteria and large amount of the hydrogen is produced. Hydrogen and methane, which are produced, are basically combustible gases. And since 1990, it is a regular practice for gastroenterologists to prepare our bubbles with, pegylated inter, uh, with the uh, peglec, that is polyethylene glycol and sodium phosphate solutions. And hence, on mannitol and sorbitol, there is a good warning. So many times when the patient comes to us in the OPD with bleeding per rectum, we know that this patient has a distal rectal lesion. So in a hurry and in an enth our own enthusiasm, we tend to do a cautery of the lesion. Does that produce uh, explosion? The answer is yes. So unprepared small bowel, even when uh, you have not given mannitol because of the large amount of the gases coming from the proximal colon can be a reason for trigger and explosion. And hence, nobody should do an APC or a polypectomy in an unprepared colon. What is an intestinal gas? In fact, intestinal gas is not a disease. It should be called a dis-ease. A variety of the GI symptoms like belching, bloating, abdominal pain, flatulence, are commonly referred to as an excessive gas. Now, this gas could either be excessively produced or it should be, could be insufficiently released or maybe it's a sim simple perception on the part of the patient. How do we distinguish between these three? Well, look at the composition of the normal gas in the intestine. Intest the, the human uh, tummy has six parts, stomach, small intestine, ascending colon, transverse colon, pelvic colon. In fact, the gas is equally distributed amongst all these six components. In fact, 65% of the gas, that is two thirds of the gas in the colon, in the uh, intestines is, resides in the large intestines. In a normal person, in a fasting state, 
the whole intestine from the stomach down to the anus contains only 100 to 200 ml of the gas. When you eat your food in the postprandial state, there is a 65% increase in the gas which is produced because of the ingestion of the food, because of the chemical reaction, because of the bacterial fermentation and then total amount of the gas typically after uh, food in a given individual is about 250 ml to 350 ml. What does this gas in the intestine consist of? Primarily it could be either swallowed gas that is nitrogen and oxygen or the gases which are produced by the bacterial fermentation. Mind you, Hydrogen and methane are the two products which cannot be produced by the mammalian cells. So whenever you have hydrogen or methane, either in the breath or in the blood or in the stool, that means there is an active malabsorption of the nutrients or there is enough bacteria which was fermenting the unfermentable food material. So what are the sources of the intestinal gas? You could be having excessive swallowing. There may be increasing intra-abdominal uh, intraluminal production of the gas by, by, by a biochemical reaction or bacterial fermentation or large amount of the diffusible gases may be moving from the blood down into the intestinal lumen. So let's see how do the gases land up in the intestinal lumen. So you have in a typical male in western world 40 gram of the protein, uh, 40 gram of the carbohydrates and around 15 gram of the protein and 7% of the fat is typically remaining undigested. As this undigested food primarily consisting of oligosaccharides, fructogalactosides, and galactosaccharides, which in primarily in the form of pears, oranges, salads, fruits, etc., that is a food for the bacteria. So, large amount of the bacteria tend to harp on this incoming undigested oligosaccharides and produce three major gases called hydrogen sulfide, methane, and hydrogen. Hydrogen sulfide H2S can be excreted into the kidney unchanged. It cannot be metabolized in the body. Whereas methane and hydrogen can be exhaled into the pulmonary circulation and out into the breath. Whereas part of the hydrogen and methane and H2S can also tri uh, trickle down into the stools. So what about hydrogen? Hydrogen is the most troublesome gas. Today, if somebody complains of gas in the tummy, it is because of the overproduction of the gas. In fact, large amount of the gas which is produced in the, in, in the intestine is absorbed into the circulation and is exhaled. And this is the basis of the breath test which is used for malabsorption of the carbohydrates or uh, SIBO, that is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth syndrome. What is the fate of this gas which is produced in the intestine? So let's see the FODMAPs or the uh, foods which contain fermentable uh, organic the, uh, disaccharide, monosaccharide, and polyols. These are the agents which are not metabolized by the small intestine. As they reach in the large intestine, in the cecum and ascending colon, they are acted upon the bacteria by the bacteria, intestinal bacteria to produce hydrogen. That can either be exhaled or converted by a sulfur-reducing bacteria into H2S, or you have if you have methanogenic bacteria, then you can convert the same hydrogen into methane. So H2S has two purposes. It is one of the important reasons for the odor or the bad odor or the foul odor in the uh, uh, stools. And it is a part, is a reason for social embarrassment for some people. And in large doses and large quantities, it is supposed to be a carcinogenic agent. Whereas the methane, which is produced from the hydrogen is an important for consumption of the gas. So this is what happens. You have undigested carbohydrates, which land up in the colon. So hydrogen has either three ways of uh, exit. It can go out into the pulmonary circulation and exhale. It can be converted by sulfur producing bacteria to produce H2S or you can have production of the methane using carbon dioxide. So methane production is an important issue because the whole world is divided into either high or low methane producer countries. We are in this high methane producer country which by definition is breath excretion of more than 23 part per million of the methane. How does methane production help? Suppose there are four molecules of hydrogen in the intestine. If they combine with one molecule of CO2, you produce one molecule of methane. In fact, production of the methane reduces the intestinal gas by almost 75%. So 100 gram of gas is converted into 25 grams simply by production of the methane. So what purpose does it serve? In fact, it is a very important reason and it is produced by a bacteria called methano uh, brevi vector smithi and it is important for reducing the total volume of the gas in the large intestines. CO2 is a 
totally innocuous gas which is produces primarily in the duodenum because of the action of the bicarbonate secreted uh, by the pancreatic juices on the incoming hydrochloric acid from the stomach best part of the co2 is it is quickly absorbed in the what in the in the blood it has a very high diffusivity and that is the reason today especially with the advent of third space endoscopy this is the procedure this is the gas of choice for all therapeutic intervention because compared to hydrogen and ox and uh, uh, oxygen this has 200 times more capacity to diffuse across the intestinal lumen back into the blood and hence whenever you do any therapeutic procedure requiring distension like third space endoscopy or prolonged endoscopy it is mandatory to use co2 then you have the agents in the food which are not digested and which contains large amount of the sulfur as i showed you sulfur containing bacteria will thrive on these food and these are primarily in the form of seafood eggs beef and mainly the poultry products so they will produce large amount of the h2s which is important agent for the uh, malodorous uh, flatus which patient complain of oxygen and nitrogen are innocuous for the body the only purpose of detecting nitrogen in the body is to know what is the source of the gas in the intestine if there is a large amount of the nitrogen in the body then we know it is occurring because of the swallowed air so who complains of gas in the uh, body anybody uh, who has a balance imbalance between a say production of the uh, gas and elimination of the gas so if you have too much of swallowing too much of chemical reaction decrease diffusion or increase fermentation you will have more gas anybody who has less belching less diffusion and less elimination in the form of constipation is more likely to have gas so it is a delicate balance between gas production and gas elimination which causes these symptoms and then coming on to the next uh, subject of bloating what is bloating Blo bloating is basically it refers to a subjective sensation of a swollen abdomen or fully belly or abdominal pressure or excess gas any of these are referred to as abdominal bloating in fact 15% of the population does complain of persistent bloating the difference between object with different distension and bloating is whereas bloating is just a symptom that means there is no objective way of assessing whether the patient has dist distension or not whereas if you are able to document increase in the girth that is the distension that is the basic difference between the bloating and distension so this young lady who complains of bloating if you look at her physiological physical parameters there will be no increase in the abdominal girth but she is still a complainant whereas a person who complains of distension it, you can easily measure it the technique to distinguish between the two has been developed by a group from london and this is called uh, ambulatory plethysmo abdominal plethysmography which dr shri shri will be talking to can we diagnose bloating as a definite organic pathology the answer is yes the if you have anybody who has uh, bloating which varies over a period of time often from morning to evening and from days to week it's more common in women than in men it in fact most of these patients do not have excessive gas in the tummy anti gas pills will not give them uh, good results and farting and belching will not give a relief so a guy who has bloating in which the farting and the belching does not give him relief that means this person has Uh, bloating and this can objectively be seen by looking at the gas which can be looked at by the either the ct scan or abdominal x rays and there is a radionuclide study also to show that minimum amount of the gas which is required to complain of bloating is 400 ml if 83% of the patient who have more than 400 ml of the gas in the tummy at given point of time will complain of bloating versus only 10% of those who have less than 400 ml of the gas so there are the there is a definite criteria for diagnosis of the functional bloating criteria one is that you need to complain of repeated symptoms for a period of 3 months at least over a 6 month period in the absence of diagnosed functional disorders like functional dyspepsia or ibs that is a room criteria for for definition of the functional bloating what causes bloating in the abdomen there are four tenses which are uh, uh, which are known to us i am rem i remember professor akesh chandran taught us in our mbbs md days that there are four apps to diagnose gallstone disease now you have 10 apps to diagnose the reasons for bloating and these include food fluid in the tummy fat flatus feces fetus fictitious complaint and flabby abdomen let's see what do they mean so anybody who has a fat 
flu who contain food which contain lot of hyperosmolar solution or which stimulates lot of secretion which will produce lot of fluid in the tummy or if you take lot of ford maps that is foods which are not fermentable in the proximal intestine all of them will produce bloating and then you have anybody who has fat and if you have too much of the fat in the tummy that gives less space for the intestine to distend and because of the lack of the distension and anybody who has recently gained weight will have feeling of bloating and distension in fact if you have too much of the flatus because of the overeating or because of the eating of the fodmat foods you are more likely to have uh, a flatus and the flatus has a different composition it has lot of hydrogen and methane you see hydrogen and methane can never be present in the swallowed air as i said these are the only two gases which are not produced by the mammalian cells you need to have bacteria to produce these cells flatus is typically present in different manner in different individual on an average one person can pass up to 22 times per day flatus but this is supposed to be abnormal if the patient has troublesome symptom or especially if the if the odor of the flatus is offensive that means you are releasing too much of h2s into the a uh, flatus there is also a direct correlation between the uh, degree of constipation and the uh, um, and the complaints of bloating the more the constipation the lesser the frequency of the stool more the chance of having bloating which is understandable because you are not able to expel the uh, gases and finally once you have flappy abdomen then this is called entroptosis that means your intestines do not have area to hold on to they just sp spread into the surrounding tissues they spread they just migrate and spout into the surrounding tissue feeling giving a feeling of uh, uh, discomfort so a combination of impaired viscerosomatic reflexes incoordinated abdominal ac accommodation and new term called abdominophrenic dysynergia is responsible for this extension of these symptoms so two things which occur i'll just explain you with this diagram it in these patients with the uh, abdominal uh, bloating so this is a normal person who after eating has normal containment of the abdominal structure so when you eat what should happen is diaphragm should relax that means it should go up internal oblique should contract so this is what is happening so with relaxation of the diaphragm and contraction of the internal oblique you have stasis of the same contents of the intestines into the abdominal wall but look at this abnormal area or a person who complains of bloating in this patient in fact the diaphragm contracts that means it moves inward and whereas internal oblique muscle tends to relax when it should be contracting so this leads to cordo ventral movement of the intestinal contents that gives the feeling of bloating so that is the present pathogenesis of bloating and this can be easily documented on ct scan you see the status of the diaphragm in the two condition and look at the difference between the spine and the Uh, abdominal wall in the two conditions so this is the patient who complains of bloating this is the patient who come had has no symptoms in addition the patient also have a visceral hypersensitivity that means whatever amount of the gas is present in the intestines the brain perceives it much more and reason for that is that in patient with irritable bowel syndrome because of the plethora of reasons the brain brain continues to have stimuli originating in the gi tract which go into the limbic cortex and from the limbic cortex it goes to the prefrontal cortex prefrontal cortex has to assess whether this is a uh, abnoxious stimulus or this is just a routine stimulus in patient with irritable bowel syndrome every upcoming afferent stimuli say from the distension in the stomach from change in the ph from change in the chemical reaction is perceived as an obnoxious stimulus which patient feel as uh, bloating and finally talking about the belching belching is defined as an eructation which is defined as an audible escape of the air from the esophagus or the stomach into pharynx in a normal person up to 30 times a belching may be normal once you are belching if you look at the air which you belch out it will contain only so uh, nitrogen and oxygen that means the area which has been swallowed most of the patient with belching do not have an underlying pathology and just to reiterate these are the habits if you are smoking if you are contain consuming too many chocolates if you are chewing gum or if you are chewing tobacco you are more likely to have uh, burping and belching because you are will be swallowing lot of airs there are two types of belching supra and the supra gastric belching and the gastric belching what happens in supra bel uh, gastric belching is the diaphragm contracts against a closed 
lower esophageal sphincter. So because of the contraction of the diaphragm, a lot of air is swallowed into the esophagus. Now, since it cannot travel down, it has only one way, which is out. And once it is coming out, the epiglottis closes because the epiglottis is smart enough not to let the air go into the lungs to produce more problems. So this air, which is swallowed incidentally, is expelled out in front of a closed glottis. That is what causes the feeling of belching. Whereas in gastric belching, it is other way around. You have relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. So the swallowed air from the stomach escapes out. So this is the cause of uh, belching in patients who have gastroesophageal reflux disease. And finally, hiccups are basically spontaneous myoclonic contractions of the diaphragm and intercostal muscles because of the rapid intake of the air against a interrupted closed glottis. It was, this was, term was introduced by Bailey in 1943. 80% of the time, the myoclonic jerks occur in the left diaphragm. And the pro problem is generated by the reflux arc, which I'm going to show you. This is what happens. If you look at this patient, this is just a small video to show how do hiccups look like. So if you see left diaphragm is involved in more often than not, it is an involuntary contraction which occurs because of the hyperstimulation of the three different mechanisms of the arc. There are three types of hiccups which are seen on day-to-day -day basis. In acute hiccups, which are very common, the disease does not last beyond 48 hours. Anybody who has more than 48 hours of persistent hiccup is a problem. And then certainly all of us would have seen patients who have intractable hiccups, which is a definition of uh, hiccups lasting for more than about a month. So hiccup basically occur because of the hyperstimulation of the three components of the arc, afferent stimuli through the phrenic nerve and vagus nerve, central processing, excessive processing because of the large number of the reasons in the brain stem. And finally, the efferent component because the contraction of the intercostal and the diaphragmatic muscles by the phrenic nerve. So any component of afferent, efferent nerve and the central stimulation can be affected by any mechanism. So there are thousand reasons for hiccups and one needs to look at the major reasons for the hiccups. And two most important reasons are idiopathic reflux disease and central causes. So this is my final slide, ladies and gentlemen, in patients who have, who complain of excessive gas. So a lot of undigested material lands up into this large intestine, which is packed with large amount of the bacteria. So a combination of the good food for bacteria leads to production of large amount of the gas, which when it is erupted from, it is comes from the upper GI tract is called belching and eructation. And when it moves out through the anus, this is called flatus. So this is the final summary slide. The knowledge of the intestinal, goes, intestinal gas goes back to as long as 1952. Intestinal gas is characterized by the belching, bloating, flatulence, and eructation. Most of the swallowed area, air, air will have high oxygen and nitrogen, whereas the, the a gas which is expelled through the flatus has to contain hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen and methane are the two gases which are exclusively produced by the bacteria. Troublesome gas is the hydrogen. The larger the amount of the hydrogen in the tummy, more the problem for the patient. Methane production, in fact, is a good for maintaining the intestinal gas balance. The only disadvantage is if you produce a lot of methane, it decreases the motility of the gut and predisposes to constipation. For offensive order, you need to have large amount of the H2S, and I have given you the list of the food which contain a lot of sulfur-containing material. Loating is a symptom, not a sign, and most important causes are abdominal muscle, muscle the abdominophrenic dysynergia coupled with visceral hypersensitivity. Belching could be either supragastric, which is mostly functional, or gastric, which is related to reflux disease. Hiccup could be acute or chronic, and it could occur because of the occurrence of problem at three different levels of arcs. With that, I'll stop sharing my slide and hand over the proceeding back to the moderators, Professor Rakesh Tandon and Rakesh Koji. Dr. Tandon, you are mute, uh, muted. Uh, you'll have to unmute. Okay. Yes. Uh, am I audible now? I'm saying yes. that Dr. Arora has 
given a, dealt this, this difficult topic very well, very informative lecture, and he has presented this very lucidly. I th I'm sure there will be many questions that will develop over a period of time, but I will request Dr. Rakesh Kocher to uh, make any comment if he wants to, or uh, call upon the next uh, speaker, who is Dr. Shri Hari uh, Anikandi. Yeah, I'll continue with the next speaker, uh, who's going to go further beyond the pathophysiology of all these troublesome symptoms, so-called simple but troublesome symptoms. And Dr. Shri Hari is going to talk about how can we objectively assess these patients? Belching, bloating, eructations, etc. How can we objectively evaluate? Dr. Shri Hari Ani Khandi is a consultant at the Institute of Liver, Gastroenterology, Pancreato, Biliary Sciences at the Sir Gangaram Hospital, Delhi. Dr. Hari, please. <clears throat> thank you, sir. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Yes, yes. Your yes. slides are on. Yeah. Thank you for the kind introduction, sir. Uh, I am indeed honored and privileged to be a part of the symposium involving all the stalwarts in gastroenterology. Uh, in the next few slides, I shall be discussing about the objective ways to assess something that is so, so not visible. So gas and bloating is a phenomenon which is, uh, cannot be seen by the naked eye. So how do we assess objectively this phenomenon of gas and bloating? So uh, it is very interesting, uh, by, uh, as seen in Dr. Arora's talk, there is a plethora of gases which are produced in the intestines at various levels. It could be either because of the swallowed air or because of something which is produced by the metabolism in the intestine. So how did we come to know of all these gases that are produced at various levels in the GI tract? Some of the most earliest studies and the best seminal studies were something done by a, a researcher called as Michael Levitt. This was somewhere in the 1970s. This was one of the earliest and best papers uh, published in any GM. Uh, the technique used was that they intubated the small intestine and they flushed argon gas. So they flushed argon gas at high flows to flush out whatever gas was present in the intestine. So argon is an inert gas and it will not cause any changes in the metabolism. All the gas was flushed out and this gas was eventually collected at the rectum. And when it was analyzed, it was seen that the composition of the gas present in the intestines com consists of the various gases like carbon dioxide, hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, methane, and oxygen. Presently, in the current scenario, we have several techniques to assess gas. That this could include in vitro intestinal st uh, stimulate simulators, uh, some indirect measurement techniques like X-ray or a CT scan, a body calorimetry or a breath test, and there are other direct measurement techniques uh, which involve collection of the platus. Now, this could uh, collection of the gas, which could be in the form of collection of platus uh, from the rectum, or just putting a tube in the intestines and collecting the gas and subject, subjecting it to uh, gas chromatography or mass spectroscopy. There is a new technique called as ingestible capsule, which I shall uh, discuss later on. Uh, so this is how uh, in a laboratory, uh, a simulator is used. So basically uh, the food is, sent through various chambers which are simulated to uh, actually replicate what is going on into the stomach by adding various nutrients, enzymes and hormones that are present at that level and whichever gases are produced can be subsequently analyzed. A body calorimeter consists of something, uh, uh, something like this. This is an airtight chamber. A person is present within this airtight chamber. There is only one way in. Uh, the air comes in and it is supplying the oxygen. The, this oxygen is utilized by the person and he is producing, uh, using it for respiration and producing various gases as well as it is sent to the intestines and through the intestinal metabolism, various gases are released uh, by belching or by uh, eructations and the air which is then released is then subjected to various sensors which then tell us what is the various types of gas that are available. Some uh, publications are, have also been done uh, have also been done using the radiological estimation. So there are two techniques to assess gas on uh, using radiology. One is the X-ray and CT. Uh, some are some have also used the MRI technique. What they do in an X-ray is it is a digitized X-ray film with a high amount of contrast between the tissues. So you outline the uh, the presence of gas at the various levels, and then the amount of gas that has been outlined is compared to the total area in the background 
and a ratio is then deduced. For a CT, uh, it is basically uh, used by determining the Hounsfield unit, which is uh, basically the air has a Hounsfield unit of minus thousand and water has a Hounsfield unit of zero. So at every pixel present in the CT, depending on the Hounsfield unit, uh, you are able to determine the amount of gas that is present in the abdomen. And it can also determine the amount of gas present at various parts of the abdomen in the small intestine as well as the large intestine. The most commonly used technique uh, uh, in most of the laboratories around is something called as a breath test. So as Dr. Anil Arora already discussed that hydrogen and methane are two unique gases which are released during respiration and these gases have the only origin through the intestine. So what is done is some test sugar is given orally. This sugar then goes on to the small intestine where it might be absorbed, it might not be absorbed. When it eventually reaches the colon which contains a lot of bacteria, this gas is then get, gets fermented by the bacteria to release uh, uh, gases like hydrogen and methane. These gases are then absorbed through the blood circulation and they go onto the lungs and then they are excreted which is then, uh, ob which is then determined by a device like this. This is a breath test device. So you blow in air through a collection chamber like this, it goes in through this device and inside this device, there is a spectroscopy system or a chromatography system, which analyzes the, num the types of gas that are present and you get uh, the levels of gas. This is a typical hydrogen estimation with uh, use of a lactulose. So you see the levels of hydrogen present at various levels uh, at various time intervals after the carbohydrate has been ingested. However, when you use breath test uh, for uh, determining gas, it is typically used for indications like when you are suspecting SIBO or malabsorption, or when you want to use, uh, when you want to see the orocecal transit time, there are some limitations. The first limitation is that the breath test has a low sensitivity. Now this low sensitivity is because there is already a baseline fermentation, which is already going on in the intestines because of, because of the present food that is the old food that is present in the intestines and the increase in hydrogen has to be much above this baseline level to be detected. So the sensitiv uh, sensitivity levels are low. It also has a low specificity because what you are actually doing is you are asking the patient to ingest carbohydrates and these carbohydrates have their own osmotic effect and hence they can increase the intestinal motility and it can give you false results. Also, you're giving large doses of ingestible digestible sugar orally like for a glucose hydrogen blood test you give around 75 grams of glucose, which is very high and it itself might not be digested and reach the colon to give you false results. Yeah, just there is a lack of standardization a webinar. That there are various uses of substrates and rates of hydrogen sampling that have been done. Uh, supra physiological doses have been used. Course, I mean, a webinar. Right to be used uh, because for example, you are using 50 gram lactose in a lactose hydrogen bread test, which is equivalent to one uh, as good as ingesting one liter of milk, which might uh, not be the right uh, dose. And the last thing is it does not predict the right side because uh, as I said, because of changes in the intestinal transit, you are not able to find out whether this uh, hydrolysis has occurred in the small intestine or in the large intestine. Once we have uh, seen the techniques for measurement of gas for abdominal distension, you have one technique that is uh, using the routine tape to measure your abdominal girth, which however does not uh, seem very practical because it is not possible to keep checking your abdominal girth uh, throughout the day. So researchers have come up uh, with a device called as abdominal induct inductance plethysmography. So what it has is basically a waist belt. This waist belt has uh, multiple interlooping wires which go around covering the circumference of the uh, abdomen. And when a current is passed through these wires, a magnetic field is generated across covering uh, across the circumference of the abdomen. Whenever there is a change in the circumference of the abdomen during inspiration or during sleeping or during standing, the change in the magnetic field gives you the difference in the diameters uh, throughout the day. And abdominal induct inductance plethysmography has been shown to have a very good correlation when you actually measure the circumference with a tape. However, the problem with intestinal gas, bloating and distension is that uh, you can never correlate that an increase in the intestinal gas will lead to bloating or a sensation of bloating will lead to abdominal distension. There have been many studies that have been done. So uh, to find out whether patients with bloating actually produce intestinal gas and the results have been variable. 
studies which have been done to see that whether patients with bloating have objective abdominal distension even for this the results have been variable so what is the what is the uh, why we cannot assess this with a one test is because it, there is a complex pathophysiology as dr anil had uh, touched upon so there are other factors also involved when a patient complains to you of bloating or distension it is not just an increase in the intestinal gas you have factors like visceral hypersensitivity you have factors like impaired gas handling where the the transit of the intestine is not uh, right because of altered intestinal transit or because there is an impaired fecal evacuation or the factor called as abdominophrenic dysynergia which was just discussed so how do we assess for this for visceral hypersensitivity a simple technique called as anorectal manometry which is nowadays available at most centers so what is done in an anorectal manometry is that a catheter uh, is inserted through the rectum and this catheter can sense the pressures that are present within the rectum and it can give you various graphs at various stages of uh, evacuation and this can help us uh, uh, know whether there is any uh, any alteration in the fecal evacuation something called as a dysynergia also when you use a balloon in the rectum and you inflate it you can see the sensations of the rectum so if a patient experiences sensations at very small distances that means he has rectal sensitivity and rectal sensitivity translates fairly well to visceral hypersensitivity many patients with ibs who have visceral hypersensitivity do show high rectal sensitivity so anorectal manometry is a good technique to find for visceral hypersensitivity to find out whether the intestinal motility is right or wrong there is a simple test called as a colonic motility study in which a simple capsules come containing radio opaque markers are ingested at specific times and then you do a x ray of the abdomen at specified hours to see the number of markers which are retained in the intestine so if all or most of the markers have been gone that means it is a normal intestinal transit if there is a retention of more than 20% of the markers and they are equally distributed throughout the colon it is a slow transit constipation if the markers are predominantly retained at the lower end it is a fecal evacuation disorder for finding out abdominophrenic dysynergia the ct scan may be helpful and uh, dr anil has already discussed this so i would not be going into detail a ct scan may be helpful in determining the positions of the diaphragm uh, and the abdominal muscles when the patient is complaining of bloating a patient who comes to you with troublesome belching so when a patient comes to you with belching one of the uh, one of the most difficult things to diagnose when the history is not uh, indicative is that whether this is a supra gastric bulge or a gastric bulge so a impedance study uh, basically helps you to find out this an impedance study is present along with a manometry system or it might also be present with a ph system so in an impedance study you can see the changes in the pressures as the air flows across if the changes in impedance as gas flows inside the esophagus the impedance increases so if the change in pressures is from above below that means the patient has swallowed this air and later vented it out so this is a typical supra gastric belch and not a gastric belch so uh, there are so many modalities and the patient uh, with uh, with a gas related disorder coming to you with so many symptoms in a practical scenario patient might be complaining of gas bloating distension belching and you have a plethora of tests that are that we just discussed breath test imaging manometry so how do you put things into perspective how do you approach actually approach in the practical sense so if a patient is coming to you with troublesome gas related symptoms it might be either bloating distension or flatulence or it might be belching so if a patient is coming to you with belching uh, the first thing that should be done is to take a good history uh, you find out whether the patient uh, whether there is any change with distraction of the patient from his belching episode so if you can keep talking to him and find out if his belching reduces or you can just distract him or you can ask him whether the belches continue uh, continue to occur during sleep if the answer to any of this is yes that is it is very likely to be a supra gastric belch which is a behavioral problem so if this does not help you the next thing that is to be done is to do an impedance study an impedance study is an objective me method to assess whether this belch is arising from the gastric part or the supra gastric part and you will be certain uh, about this too one thing to note here is that if the patient with belching some patients say for example with achalasia might come to you with belching so in in such patients if there are you have to be very careful about alarm symptoms if the patient is complaining of dysphagia or weight loss you can go in directly for other modalities like an endoscopy or an imaging next coming to a patient who is coming to you with bloating distension or flatulence the first thing that has to be assessed in these patients 
is whether there are presence of any alarm features so alarm features would be a nocturnal abdominal pain weight loss presence of blood in stool fever vomiting etc if the answer to any of this is yes it is very likely to be an organic disorder if the answer to all is no it is likely to be a functional bloating disorder if the patient if you are suspecting it is an organic bloating disorder you should evaluate the patient carefully for a malabsorption syndrome this would include stool tests like tests for fat fecal fat giardia celiac serology and this is the place where your breath tests come into play the breath test unfortunately have not been proven to be proven to be of much benefit in functional uh, bloating disorders but they can be used in organic disorders because of the various problems that they have you can do an endoscopic evaluation if this not contributory one important thing that has to be done is abdominal pelvic imaging as this as sir discussed about the various f's it has been seen that some patients who have early ascites also come to you with significant bloating so you be very careful and search for it especially women who come to you with bloating and patient has a history of family history of ovarian or breast cancer you should uh, be keen on suspecting for a pelvic mass and look for it and uh, uh, before uh, jumping on to conclusions now next coming on to functional bloating if you think that the patient has a functional bloating and not organic uh, based on a primitive history the first thing that has to be seen is whether it is associated with constipation so if a patient is coming to you with constipation it is very likely that because of the change in the intestinal transit the intestinal transit has become slow so there is lot of time for the intestinal contents to come in contact with the bacteria there is increased fermentation and so there is increased bloating so once you have a patient with constipation you can go ahead with the tests like anorectal manometry and a colonic transit study based on these two tests you can find out whether the patient has a fecal evacuation disorder he has a slow transit constipation or if he has high rectal sensitivity is likely to be ibs and you can treat accordingly and that might give you better results if there is no symptoms there is no constipation you again go back to the history you take a detailed history uh, this could include what are the aggravating factors whether there is a high intake of fodmaps whether there are aerophagic behaviors like frequent chewing of gum or taking of intake of carbonated beverages whether the bloating is related to perimenstrual period in females because there are hormonal changes these they tend to get bloated recent weight gain because of the fat accumulating in the abdomen as uh, dr anil had discussed could lead to bloating there is, whether there is any major psychosocial issue if none of this is contributory you can go ahead for a ct abdomen to uh, or an abdominal emg to check for abdominal the phrenic dyssynergia if nothing is contributory a uh, higher center referral could be thought of in fact now we have very primitive techniques which don't yield much uh, results but there have been studies recent publications which have uh, increased the pros prospects of utilizing intestinal gas as a very good marker to find out various diseases one of the techniques used is a intestinal uh, telemetric gas sensing capsule so what you have to do is just swallow a simple capsule and this capsule has various sensors which goes real time into the intestine and it can give you the concentrations of various gases at various levels and this happens at in real time so actually the gas sensing technique uh, through a capsule is very sensitive much much higher than what is present in a breath test and it can it can give you uh, much more relevant information along with the location of gas a very interesting technique is something called as an electronic nose so what it basically has is there are various Uh, gas sensors uh, that are present in this device so when the gas is sent into through these sensors uh, you can find out that the various uh, types of gas these are especially volatile organic compounds that are present in the gas and based on uh, the actual amount of gas uh, the different types of volatile organic compounds present in this you could actually find out or you could actually predict the type of disease that is causing this type of uh, spectrum of the vocs it was hippocrates who in in uh, who is considered to be the father of medicine who in 4400 bc had actually told us that the patient's odor could lead to the diagnosis of the disease and this actually seems to be coming true with an electronic nose with a simple device like this you could actually analyze the uh, gas composition and it could predict that the patient has this disease and there are already so many publications especially in patients with ibd or bile acid diarrhea or ca colon where by using the electronic nose technique you have they have been able to di distinguish patients with a high sensitivity next coming on to hiccups uh, hiccups as sir said was it is a persistent or in, uh, it is a, a, a contraction of the diaphragm uh, which leads to this symptom 
but it is very important to realize that persistent or intractable or intractable hiccups could be the first presentation of a serious disorder and so it requires extensive diagnostic testing on occasions where it is uh, present for a prolonged period of time so for evaluating a patient who is presenting with intractable hiccups the first thing that is very crucial is to see a take a accurate drug history uh, drugs like tramadol dexamethasone diazepam midazolam etc are known to cause hiccups after that you have to find uh, take the history and uh, uh, history of the associated uh, symptoms and examination which should be focused on all components of the reflex arc the reflex arc that uh, dr anil just discussed so it should include a detailed ear no nose throat and neck examination a detailed cnx examination chest examination and an abdominal examination and subsequent evaluation may be directed accordingly so if you have any symptoms related to any of these disorders you can the subsequent evalu evaluation could be directed to that uh, side uh, in a patient who has an advanced malignancy and it is a common scenario for most of these patients to come with hiccups uh, there is uh, it is suggested that there is extensive evaluation can be done away with because uh, the treatment outcomes in these patients might not be worthy and it is better to go in for empirical therapy in these cases rather to go in for a extensive evaluation so uh, based on the reflex arc it is very important to know this reflex arc which starts right from the brain stem or uh, some areas in the cervical cord and it goes right up to through the vagus nerve to the visceral organs including the mediastinal organs uh, you first do a detailed ear nose throat and neck examination a simple blood investigation which includes leukocyte counts kidney function test and electrolytes liver function test amylase lipase or a cortisol levels if none of these is contributory an upper gi endoscopy or a ph study might help because grd seem to be one of the most common causes of hiccups uh, if the history is not suggestive then you can think of evaluating for the cns disorders with by doing a mri brain or a cervical spine uh, a ct thorax 2d echo for cardiac disorders and a ct abdomen and uh, it is very likely by doing all this test that you can actually find out the cause of hiccups and uh, treat it accordingly so ladies and gentlemen the take home message is that there are a plethora of tests which are available for intestinal gas analysis however only few of these yield actionable information at present a step by scientific assessment might help us in directing the appropriate therapy uh, recent advances hold exciting prospects for non invasive diagnosis of major disorders with simple gas analysis and for hiccups the components of the reflex arc should be focused while evaluating for intractable symptoms thank you very much you are muted sir yes uh, am i audible yes yes, yes you are yes sir uh, thank you dr hari for a very elaborate uh, discussion on the presentation on the uh, likely tests which can be done and which can be helpful in diagnosing uh, these conditions particularly the organic part of organic uh, etiology of these conditions you will agree that most of our patients would be we would label them as functional and they they would require uh, immediate attention and immediate uh, diagnosis kind of a thing and uh, in some patients particularly like intractable hiccups or uh, troublesome uh, um so you can say malabsorption or something like that as a cause of uh, abdominal distension we we do require extensive investigations but most of the patients would uh, warrant only minimal investigations but it is a, uh, good to understand that you have a lot of tests which will tell you the organic component organic etiology of these symptoms and these symptoms cannot be left just in the category of functional some of these patients will need to be investigated i i recall some patients with belching the common cause in a few of them was aerophagia so lot of patients will swallow air inadvertently while sipping water or sipping tea or uh, you know eating slowly talking while eating so all these symptoms 
uh, all these causes can be uh, can result in something troublesome as uh, belching so with that i think we'll go on to the next uh, part of it therapeutics dr rakesh tandon please to carry yes, on with the, yeah. the next topic is uh, uh, what do we do with this now that we know what are the sources of uh, gas in the gut we also know how to objectively uh, assess how much of the gas and what are the possible sources as uh, told by dr shri hari now with what do we do with it so we are the lo next logical topic is pharmacotherapy and for that we have a very senior uh, gastroenterologist dr naresh bhat who have, was uh, chief of uh, who is a chief of uh, gastroenterology and liver uh, disease at CMI Bangalore he is uh, been the president of ISG and the president of SGEI both in the past and i request dr bhat now to give his talk please uh, thank you professor tandon and uh, my good friend rakesh kochar uh, i agree with uh, rakesh's comment that investigations do not form a great part of the, the approach to these patients except in that group of malabsorption and a lot of it has to be managed at the history level and maybe very few investigations to support the diagnosis next slide please uh, i'd address the first symptom of hiccup i must admit that there is very little hard data uh, for this the uh, initial studies came with iv clopromazine way back in 1950s and uh, after that there have been maybe one odd rct using some of the newer drugs but there is really no hard data and most of it is based on case series again these case series are a little biased between uh, those reported by physicians and those reported by neurologists who obviously have used different kind of drugs and each of them uh, claim that that is the best option and i think the big change that we've seen in these last 20 years from the times that we used clopromazine to now some of the newer medication next slide now if you look at the pharmacotherapy of hiccup we have two major agents one is baclofen and one is gabapentin both are gaba agonists acting in the brain as well as in at the level of the cord and interrupt the hiccup reflux uh, reflex now the dose of baclofen is generally 5 to 10 mg 3 times a day uh, typically what i do is i get a serum creatinine and if there's no renal failure and the patient is not on dialysis i am quite happy starting on 10 mg 3 times a day unless they are very elderly patients the effect is seen fairly quickly and uh, hiccups most often stop in the first few days itself complete resolution the side effects are of course drowsiness weakness and sometimes respiratory depression and this is especially so in patients with renal dysfunction because uh, baclofen is eliminated from the kidney now the duration of therapy can be just one dose can sort of your problem um, and sometimes you we use up to a month most of the time uh, we have quite happy uh, stopping at about 5 days because it resolves the problem now gabapentin is the favorite of the neurologists and typically they use either gabapentin or pregabalin and they use doses of about 300 to 400 mg again three times a day this again has uh, issues with the kidney and so you have to have an idea what the renal function is the effects can be immediate and uh, in neurological conditions it may take a long time for you to be able to stop the medication so typically we taper down the medication over 3 to 4 weeks it has a similar problem of drowsiness and dizziness and compared to chlorpromazine which was the all time favorite as far as the seniors are concerned 
Global provisine has far more adverse effects apart from the experimental effects. There's dryness of mouth, a lot of dizziness, uh, drowsiness, and so on. Next slide. Uh, what we sometimes need to do is co-prescribe or add on drugs. And one of them is PPI. Uh, we know that uh, GRD can be one of the factors triggering reflux. And so PPI and prokinetics may find a role in therapy. But what happens is someone who's got reflux, which is, I'm sorry, hiccups persisting for a few days, invariably because of the transient uh, diaphragmatic contractions, it actually encourages a GRD and so results in esophagitis, which then perpetuates the uh, hiccups and so it's a good idea if you have a patient who's not settling down with one of these drugs is to add a PPI. Uh, of course, uh, in our practice, we find hyponatremia being a very important cause of a persistent hiccup. And that's what I would tell my resident to check as a routine and address it. Uh, we sometimes have to use baclofen and gabapentin rarely. Metoclopramide, domperidone are add-on drugs, but they have their share of problems. And in my practice um, as a gastroenterologist, I seldom have to go beyond baclofen and PPI. Next slide. What we also have to do is other techniques is sometimes just doing an OGD, whether you find some esophagitis or not, just the act of doing an OGD and perhaps decompressing the stomach somehow breaks that uh, reflex arc or in a more refractory case, uh, we used to uh, use a nasogastric tube, leave it for 24 to 48 hours to stop the hiccup. Of course, rebreathing techniques and bland diets are also important aspects. And I'm sure Dr. Tyagi will um, uh, deal with some of these issues. There are, next slide. People have used other salvage drugs and therapies and typically the neurologists would use um, valproate, phenytoin. There are also even uh, some case reports of nifedipine being used to uh, stop the hiccup. Acupuncture has been tried and there's a study from uh, China which says that acupuncture can be pretty useful in uh, intractable hiccup. And of course, uh, we always talk about phrenic nerve block or uh, crushing the phrenic nerve. Uh, in my 40 years, I've never had to resort to that. Maybe Professor Rakesh Tandon may have something to add to this. So this, is, uh, this slide uh, essentially tells you what our pharmacological approach is for hiccup, baclofen or gabapentin and co-prescription of one of these drugs. And typically it may be a PPI. Next slide. Now, when we come to intestinal gas and bloating, my understanding is that there are three factors. One is the factor of dysmotility. Two is that of a perception problem. And three is actually that there is an excess of gas. Next slide. When we have dysmotility, one of the things is an impaired gastric accommodation. And these are patients who typically tell you, dog, I start eating a meal, but I can't finish it. I just eat a little and I start feeling full and you know it's kind of tight. And this is um, most likely to be an impaired gastric accommodation. And this is the subgroup of patients whom I find acushamide is pretty helpful. And we start off with 100 mg thrice a day before a meal keep it for about four weeks to decide whether he's responding or not. If he responds, we go on for a few months. If they don't respond, then obviously we stop. Uh, then we have the other group who says, no, I'm able to eat the meal, but immediately after that, a little while, I find that it remains full. And you know, I keep belching or you know, I have to loosen my trouser, loosen my dress and so on. And these are the patients who perhaps have a component of gastroparesis. And here, 
we uh, use uh, prokinetics, which are helpful in the upper GI tract. Cisapride uh, used to be a favorite, but no longer available. So we make do with drugs like sinitopride or domperidone. And if there is constipation, um, brucolopride gives us a bonus uh, effect because it has some effect on gastroparesis as well. Of course, if the patient has constipation, in addition, of course, the conventional therapies uh, for constipation would certainly alleviate some of the bloating uh, and uh, symptoms of that nature. It's very important to make this assessment as to what may be the underlying cause. And we may not be entirely accurate, but it gives us a reasonable idea as to what should be the pharmacological drug of choice in these patients. Next slide, please. We now next come to this group of patients who have a perception issue or visceral hypersensitivity. And here is the role of neuromodulators. The drugs that are usually used are amitriptyline. Uh, the doses that are recommended are much higher than we use for patients with irritable bowel, where we are quite happy with 10 mg or 25 mg. But here, when we are dealing with uh, the functional dyspepsia group, we new, use uh, higher dosages. And that is what makes a lot of GI physicians a little uncomfortable of using these medications. And hence, they continue to use prokinetics. But it's important to reiterate that prokinetics may address only some part of the problems and it is important to be comfortable with the use of these medications as well. The other drug is Escitropram in 10 to 20 mg per day or Buspiron, which is a 5-HD1A agonist at doses of 10 to 15 mg per day. Typically, I start off with about 7.5 mg per day and then build up the dose depending on the response. Next slide, please. Now you have a group of patients who are actually genuinely generating excess gas and some of them uh, may have uh, a SIBO or there may be issues of the microbiome that is involved. Obviously, one would treat the basic disorder that um, Anil and uh, Sri Hari have uh, elaborated about you know, systemic diseases like endocrine disorders, like hypothyroidism, diabetes, or their malabsorption, if they have infections, obviously one would treat them. But my, my first therapeutic uh, modification would be on the diet, which I leave it to Dr. Tyagi to talk about. But the other things that one would have to sort of consider would be antibiotics, or managing dysmotility or probiotics. Next slide. So probiotics is a great concept of altering the microbiome. Biome. There are an absolute dizzy arrow of options of so many combinations, but the sad truth is that most of these do not work. There are some reports of bifidobacterium and lactobacillus bacillus sporogenes and bacillus coagulans showing some benefit, but uh, other trials clearly show that these are almost useless. There is a report about VSL3 reducing flatulence, but not the bloating. And actually there's a very interesting paper by uh, Satish Rao a uh, little more than a year ago, where he showed that probiotics can actually cause or worsen brain fogginess by increasing D-lactic acid. So probiotics in my uh, practice have actually little or no role. Next slide. Now antibiotics, we have uh, rifax, rifaximine, which has been widely used and abused for all kinds of indications. Yes, one could try you know, dosage of 400 a BG or TID for about 10 to 15 days. The results show that there's a positive initial response for the first two weeks, and then the response kind of tapers thereafter. I mean, predictably, because the microbiome comes back to its um, former status, and so the antibiotic has 
therefore doesn't have a persistent benefit. So are we really justified or is it safe to give recurrent cyclical pauses? I leave it to you to decide. Personally, I don't believe that recurrent cyclical pauses are important just to treat bloating and gas. If they have a SIBO, if they have some kind of structural abnormality, absolutely justified, but not otherwise. We have uh, simpler uh, alternatives, home remedies. We have peppermint oil available commercially. We have uh, ginger, asafoetida, ajwain seeds. I think most people would uh, try this at home. And they are fairly uh, sort of efficacious in their own way to bring out the bloating and gas. Activated charcoal available uh, commercially as carbindon or distanil has been tried and does decrease gas and bloating. But for some reason, um, I feel it is underused. Then, of course, the Japanese have put out their own um, herbal drug called Rikon Shito, uh, which has been found to be useful. And I think it's time that uh, Indian gastroenterologists also do a trial with our own uh, available therapies and see how much we can benefit our patients. Next slide, please. So to conclude, my strategy of using pharmacological therapy is basically start with understanding the pathophysiology. What is happening? Uh, whether the symptoms coming on, how quickly after a meal, is it likely to be in the stomach? Is it likely to be in the small bowel? See if what kind of patient is he? Does he have uh, you know, anxiety or depressive traits? And see what are the associated symptoms. Does he have a systemic disease? Does he have constipation that also needs to be addressed? Does he have migraine that needs to be addressed as well? Then target the specific abnormality. And I prefer to use monotherapy. I seldom use uh, multiple drugs in these patients, at least as a start. If they have upper GI symptoms, I use acoshemite or sometimes a prokinetic or use acoshemite uh, as a first line and then use maybe seritopride or something else as a second line therapy. If they have small bowel symptoms, I do use one course of rifaximin uh, for about 10, 15 days. Once the patient feels comfortable, then we talk to him about the deleterious effects of recurrent doses of antibiotics and then perhaps move on to a neuromodulator. But of course, the bottom line is uh, the benefits of diet, lifestyle modification, behavioral therapy that Dr. Tyagi will talk to us about are always paramount. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhatt. That was an elegant talk. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. okay. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. What Dr. Bhatt has told you to individualize therapy in a given patient assess as to what are the most likely causes of, of uh, the discomfort in his patient, in this patient, and you try to individualize and, and you start with monotherapy, and then if needed, add other drugs. A couple of things I'd just like to say, I, don't, I think that I'd like to emphasize that we have not used enough charcoal of late. Cymetricone and charcoal have been used for a long time, but when we were uh, like, you know, 25, 30 years, we used to use charcoal only for absorbing gas and effect. And so I think that I agree with, with him that we should, we have been underusing this particular drug. Cymetricone I find very useful in some patients. I wonder why uh, Dr. Bhatt has not mentioned about levosulfide because I have found that also as a very good prokinetic, though I agree that Sintapro is the main drug for a small gut uh, uh, motility. But I think new cell pride I have also found uh, pretty useful. So I think that we will further discuss this. I'm sure there will be questions with regard to this. And uh, we go on to the uh, next talk. May I request Dr. Kocher to then introduce uh, Dr. Tyagi and his topic? Uh, well, <clears throat> the, the next part of the symposium is the, probably the most interesting one. 
and uh, most insightful one, particularly coming from Dr. Tyagi, who tends to go get away like Naresh Bhatt away from the pharmacopoeia to actual clinical practice and how best to alleviate this, these symptoms, which more often are functional, quote unquote. So it will be something very interesting, which we all should be looking forward to Dr. Tyagi's uh, presentation. Dr. Tyagi. Um, well, I hope uh, everybody can hear me, and if they can't, yes. I'm sure they won't miss much. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you today is practically what all of you already know, and I'm just going to reaffirm your beliefs and uh, perhaps to very little beyond that. Uh, I wish to thank Dr. Arora. I don't know why, uh, because... Uh, he allotted me a topic, management beyond pharmacotherapy. And after uh, the three wise men had already spoken practically everything about the simplicity of gas and bloating and belching, which I thought would not last more than five minutes, uh, what is actually left in this mango season for me is this. I doubt if I can uh, chew on it any further but I'll actually try my best. Where do I begin? First of all, you know, for a disease whose spelling we don't know much about, uh, uh, before that, let me tell you, I have no secretarial help. So whatever mistakes I make are entirely my own. And I really, uh, nobody helps me out with much when I'm preparing for a talk. Uh, well, uh, hiccups, we don't even know the spellings true because the Americans call it this, so does Dr. Arora. The true Brits call it this. And of course, um, Mr. Tharoor calls it probably Singaltas. And therefore, it was wonderful, Dr. Arora. I can only say what an idea, Sergi, to have a topic uh, to discuss as simple, as complex, and yet as engrossing as just farting. So we come to gas, bloating, and hiccups and the art behind the science. And behind actually means beyond the science and not your own behind. And this little picture that I have made at the bottom, that of Van Gogh, I'll come to that later towards the end. But let's begin with the art behind the science. Well, you see, you have an organic illness. You have all these conditions. I'm talking about all of them you have a psychogenic illness, and you have malingering. And simultaneously with them, when you have an organic illness, you have the pharmacotherapy. With a psychogenic illness, you probably have pharmacotherapy, plus you have the art of treating these patients. And if it's malingering, it's just your art and your management of the patient and uh, who blinks first. So basically keeping that in mind, Let's first get to, you know, you will find a lot of patients who are malingering. They are malingering gas and they are malingering this. And how do you make that out? Well, malingering is basically an act. It's not a psychological condition. There's a lot of secondary gain. It's accompanied by real mood and personality disorders. You'll find these patients to have a lot of mood swings. It's inconsistencies between descriptions is very important. So if you believe, if you feel in your own art of medicine that somebody is malingering, you rapidly ask him question. It's like a rapid question time. And you'll find that there's a lot of inconsistency. The pain which was at one particular area might shift to another. The bloating might shift to distension, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you actually have to differentiate between malingering and a psychogenic cause for all the symptoms that we have been talking about. And if you get to the psychogenic part, uh, then in children and even in adults, we have to realize that childhood emotional deprivation, it's a condition in psychiatry, which is really important. So one has to go if you really want to help these patients out, instead of uh, the battery of tests, we need to spend a battery of minutes and 
possibly a lot of minutes to really get back into what the history what the social background and what exactly is what has initiated this it's not always stress is not always caused by something bad stress can also be caused by something good so you have to actually go back into the history of whatever has happened from the time this patient started having these psychogenic symptoms adult attention seeking behavior is yet another uh, important thing that we should remember and it would have not a lot of secondary gain but very little secondary gain and again this attention seeking behavior is to basically it competes with that emotional deprivation that may have taken place must remember there's little secondary gain for these patients who are having let's say belching or or um, flatulence uh, for such a long time in families you'll find that there's borrowing of symptoms children or young adults who come with the, these symptoms a history would probably tell you that their parents their mothers who had also been saying the same thing and they actually borrow it and there's a long duration of history when you have these psychogenic symptoms and as a matter of fact one of the very simple things is that the size of the patient's file is inversely proportionate to him or her actually having an organic disease the more thick the file the more slim the chances that the patient is going to have an organic illness the symptoms don't match the investigations and let me tell you that show you that in a little description because this is important because it's also it can be used as a part of communication so if this is the severity of what the patient is saying and you have the symptoms on top on black and the evidence is which the patient is carrying in all that thick file and all the investigations that have been done so far you'll find that the arrows of symptoms might be well beyond 5 7 8 there lot of symptoms but when you go and you look into evidence the evidences are rather low it could be very high as well but then if the difference between the evidence and the symptomatology is not gap this gap is the psychological gap so if you have a narrow gap the chances of having an organic disease is much more then if you find that the gap is tremendous and then the lot of psychological elements are present now why i gave this little thing is the art of medicine the art of treating these patients is in the recognition the interpretation and the communication of the difference between the symptom and the evidence so you can do a 100 tests and show it to the patient that they are negative but unless you are able to communicate to the patient and to the family the importance of these negative tests the importance of mind over body and somehow each of us have to develop that art of medicine that art of communication that we have to tell them as to where and why if the investigations are normal your patient is unlikely to have anything organic and we need to deal it in very differently the red flag signs for psychogenic disorders we talked about red flag signs for organic disease are if all the symptoms if the patient is having belching the patient is having bloating the patient is having flatulence if all of them are present together the chances of being psychogenic are far more expulsion of gases on pressing any body parts you must have seen these patients do it very regularly they'll press their biceps and they'll burp and they'll say it's my headache is related to my gas and my sleep is related to everything that's happening in their lifetime is happening because of gas and these are the red flag signs that this is not an organic disease the other very important things are that the symptoms can be reproduced almost as if on demand to show you that the husband will say oh she she actually uh, burps so loudly that the neighbors can hear it and lo behold the moment he finished this statement the wife will burp to prove his point and a very nervous husband lovingly trying to project it are all red flag signs for psychogenic disorders now the ladies in this group will think who are listening why am i using husband why am i using the female gender to be describing all this well there is a reason for it 
because an organic cause can be identified in far more men than in women and not just that in cases of these cases these psychogenic cases somehow are less in urban societies because most people can verbalize their problems however rural and traditional people may be unable to explain their emotional problems and share them with their family members and therefore they manifest in conversion reactions and in somatization so i hope you understand the more uh, educated a person is the more uh, communication free the person is the more they can share with their partners with their families the less are the chances of these present in those families therefore the dependent personality traits of a patient may be one of the contributory factors in the genesis of these disorders which aggravate the symptoms and also there is could be these could be very early signs of depressive illness a tangible secondary gain is being the excessive attention one gets therefore if you have somebody who is from that kind of background which is 80% of my practice a rural background you will see these symptoms to be really very prominent in our opds every day and lo behold if you start writing all the investigations that were possible this patient will probably have nothing left to eat mm -hmm. so we've already done with bloating and distension the frequency of reporting abdominal bloating in individuals with functional gastrointestinal disease in ibs is almost about 23 to 96% in functional dyspepsia about 15 in chronic constipation also rather high we've already said that both of them one is a feeling and the other is actually measurable but both have a tremendous negative impact on the quality of life and it may be linked with other gas related complaints so what is really important which i gave in the previous slide is it's not just one symptom if you go deeper into the history or if you talk to the patient more they'll have more such functional disorders associated which will give you a fairly good idea as to what's happening we've also discussed burping versus hiccups the chances of getting hiccups which are generally gastric they are generally slightly longer lasting than burping there's good response to pharmacotherapy there's reasonable chances of finding a cause associated with secondary illness they are not voluminous and they are not loud and they could continue to be nocturnal the exact opposite is that of burping the generally supragastric they are short lasting poor response to pharmacotherapy lot of secondary gain attention seeking behavior and all that i told you before and what has been talked about in the previous so beyond pharmacotherapy what do we have well obviously each of your patients with these illnesses if you don't talk to them they are going to get up and say and ask you whether there are any dietary precautions or whether there is any dietary changes that needs to be taken and therefore we all acknowledge that nutrition and diet plays a crucial role in the health and nutritional advice Uh, and it's part of their role however providing detailed nutritional advice useful to the patient is not common in practical settings let me be very frank about it that we may confess that we had we do a lot of good dietary advice and we talk about it but when it actually comes to practice we are not doing a good job if you see at the lower part that diagram when doctors were asked how much good dietary advice they give 84% of them randomly said we give good dietary advice but in fact when you ask them specifically in an outpatient they said in an inpatient they felt slightly better uh, when in objectively it was assessed about 50% were able to give a decent uh, a dietary advice but in an outpatient it was only 20% and this is quite evident from the upper graph as to what are the barriers that we face in giving dietary advice well time is one compensation for that amount of time is another there's no patient compliance doctor feels even if i tell them they are not going to follow that ability to identify patients who would benefit we don't know they don't know which patients would benefit so one gets into a habit of not giving dietary advice our own skills are a barrier our own knowledge about nutrition we are not really seriously taught this subject in the medical college 
uh, are you know one of the reasons why we talk a lot about diet but we are not able to convert that into actual practice as a matter of fact there has been a dietitian first gastroenterology clinic initiative that has taken place uh, elsewhere in the united states where the patients are triaged by a gp into those who should first go to a dietitian rather than a gastroenterologist and it is the dietitian who talks to them and if necessary gives them the dietary advice because that's ultimately what every patient should receive then as you can see it goes down here the initial assessment at the dfgc if requires if they feel that it expedites uh, urgent review it they go on to the gastroenterologist otherwise they manage them they manage them with dietary therapy if that dietary therapy does not work then they are again sent to the ge department this actually has reduced the waiting time for patients to see a ge specialist because a lot of the uh, patients actually have what we call as uh, functional gastrointestinal disorders which are tremendously helped by diet when we come to diet the basic dietary advice that at least we can give to the patient is do not those who have these symptoms is do not consume too much food in one sitting so split your food apart if you have food sensitivities we should actually check it out and we should go into the history the patients are rather good at giving these histories uh we should see for lactose and gluten uh sensitivities drinking too much of carbonated drinks the urban population drinks i have seen children who will not have water and the carbonated drinks are a part of their uh, their staple drinking habits while having food another very important part is to take a history whether these symptoms become worse during menstruation last year in the ibd i actually gave a talk on i on menstruation as to how difficult it is somehow for us male doctors to be talking about menstruation freely especially with the rural women who are not used to this sort of conversation and then this is more present in the rural women so it actually becomes a lot of problems but the good news is that exercise during this period and which is again something that is not permitted in most places uh tends to help and of course we should not take stress about all this and eat food with less preformed ideas that these foods are going to be bad and therefore we always expect the patients to actually first remove the foods they suspect from their diet and then gradually reintroduce which means challenge and rechallenge and then only confirm that diet is going to help them so try smaller foods eat slowly don't gulp it down avoid drinking through a straw check your dentures that's extremely important people who have loose fitting dentures tend to swallow much more air and don't smoke and if this complain of just flatulence but if they complain of foul smelling flatulence we've already talked about uh, h2s well there are certain foods that need to be avoided which is cabbage cauliflower beer foods very high in proteins because they have a distinct broccoli is also one of them in urban population because that tends to give you a very foul flatulent odor so it's possible take a walk after after your food the movement promotes a steady passage of gas through the gut making episodes of flatulence less likely and people somehow who regularly exercise bloating report re report that physical activity tends to reduce the symptoms of bloating so that is important all throughout we've been hearing about fodmap and somehow i got the impression that fodmap are bad no they are not actually bad there some of them are actually essential foods but in case you are intolerant to them then you have to avoid fodmaps so when you are taking the history you have to actually take specific history whether this patient had uh, has in their diet uh, any of the oligo di monosaccharides or polylols and whether eliminating each one of them at a time 
help these patients now so fodmap basically is fermentable oligo di monosaccharides and polylols well we know that monosaccharide is plain glucose and glucose is rather well tolerated by the stomach it is the fructose the sucrose which comes from fructose that becomes more difficult for them to digest in the di mon the di saccharides are two chains two mono chains form a disaccharide and these are sucrose and maltose and lactose and we all know that a lot of our indian population is intolerant to lactose and therefore it becomes important to talk about it you have the oligosaccharides which are between 8 to 10 monosaccharide chains and in this you have galactose and fructose and both of them could be troublesome to the gut why they are actually troublesome and then you, of course you have polylols which are sorbitol mannitol and xylitol and of that mannitol is the most important we've already talked in the very first few slides of dr aroda he talked about uh, mannitol and therefore having talked about the basics uh, what are oligosaccharide foods are wheat legumes some fruits and vegetables such as garlics and onions so these are oligosaccharides and here when wheat is mentioned and you eliminate wheat from the diet it we are not talking about gluten enteropathy in gluten enteropathy or celiac it's actually not intolerance it's sensitivity there is an immune system involved so there is an immunogenic response of the gut in fodmap and in intolerance it is the volume of what you take so you can eliminate it but when you reintroduce it and you reintroduce it in smaller volumes this is very well tolerated by the patient and therefore you have to actually think about intolerance to these food rather than sensitivity to these foods similarly you have disaccharide which are milk yogurt soft cheese and lactose is the main carb that is involved monosaccharides fructose is the main uh, carb mangoes this year at at this part of the season and honey these are all monosaccharides that sometimes can cause uh, a problem to the patient and they need to be eliminated but eliminated only when the patient shows you intolerance to the fodmap foods and then there are polymols which are actually uh, low calorie sweeteners sugar free gum blackberries and certain vegetables now evidence from four high quality studies have concluded that if you actually get the fodmaps out of the diet in patients who have bloating and are related almost 80% or greater would benefit from it foods that are naturally low you can't tell the patient what not to eat the next question is what should i eat so you also need to know foods that are naturally low in food maps so these are in proteins chicken egg fish lamb prawns and tofu so soya bean basically uh, this is a soya bean paneer so soya bean is rather good in whole grain we already know rather well that how to eliminate gluten and all that is not gluten is okay uh, as fodmap in fruits which are permitted which do not cause so much of bloating are bananas kiwis lime oranges papaya pineapple strawberries fancy foods but i put banana right in the beginning and oranges because they are one of the cheapest most readily available food for practically any socio economic status patient that might come to you in vegetables the good ones are carrots eggplants capsicum carrots and uh, eggplants are rather inexpensive tomatoes spinach tori you'll see patient say mai ghia tori kha ke i am quite happy with my stomach there's a reason for it you know we tend to just think that they are habitual to it and they've eliminated food maybe they've over eliminated food but yes zucchini which basically is tori is a low fodmap food in nuts almonds are good peanuts are good and uh, pine nuts uh, are good and walnuts are rather good in seeds you have lot of seeds sunflower pumpkin seeds in dairy lactose free milk is rather nice oils coconut and olive oils are good this there's an extra o here which doesn't really mean that it's an extra refined olive oil 
is just a misprint. Beverages, now tea without milk. There was a question there. So black tea, coffee, green tea, peppermint tea, these are all rather good. They are low FODMAP foods. In condiments, which is in masalas, you can have a fairly good masala food by using chilies, ginger, mustard, pepper, salt, and vinegar. These are all rather good low FODMAP foods. So there's a lot of advice about foods that can be given and they might help on, on this issue. And therefore, the next slide actually showed that uh, this, uh, th th this was a rather complicated slide which showed how pancreatic enzymes break these oligosaccharides in the, in the stomach and in the small gut and what reaches the large gut is what is fermented further that creates gas. But if I explained this all rather well, I would be considered far too intelligent, which I do, I'm not. And it might ask too many, uh, Dr. Rakesh Tandon might ask me rather embarrassing questions, which I might not be able to answer. So I'll go ahead. Exercise. Now we have diet as one part. Exercise is also extremely important in these patients. This is all global gyan. So I know a lot of you think we already know that, but yes, repeating it is always good. So yoga for bloating is rather good. We have Pilates, which is nothing but a lot of uh, core strengthening, the mid body strengthening, abdominal strengthening exercises. It's also believed to be a great stress reducer. And if nothing else, just do stretching exercises, pull out your yoga mat and go down and do a lot of extension exercises, stretching exercises, including bending your knees up to your shoulders and this sort of exercises. These are found technically found to be extremely useful. Yoga itself, let me just uh, give you a hint, is not just uh, Ramdev theories. You know, it has a sound basis. What it says is that you can divide, divide, yoga divides basic ailments into the adhivyadhis and the anadhivyadhis. And the adhivyadhis are the ones in which samanya are the ordinary somatic illnesses. And when you get down to treatment through yoga, what it says is that basically part of it, when you do yoga, you are stress-free and that deals with the imbalance in your autonomic nervous system, which leads to bowel problems of contractility. And then they divide the body into three parts. The upper part, which is uh, vanishta prana, that means the heart and the lungs, which if there is defect in that would lead to the samanya, which is the stomach, which is digestion. And then the last is the disturbed apan. The apan is the excretory part, the, the bladder and the, and the colon. So different yoga asanas would actually deal with different parts and help out because if you, they said they have a disturbance in the samanya, then there would be over digestion or non digestion or wrong digestion. And therefore in IBD, they believe it is the disturbance, the colonic disturbance. So there really is a scientific method to it. I think anybody can go down. We can actually uh, read a few asans and tell the patients what they can do. And the patient would happily do that. Folklore. There's a folklore. There's no solid scientific proof to pair with, to deal with all the century old anecdotes that scare treats hiccups. And there are several home remedies that might go like chewing on cold uh, chewing ice and getting a fright and all that. These are all uh, pulling out your tongue, doing the Valsalva maneuver. They're all related to vagal stimulation. So home remedies basically concentrate on vagal stimulation. This actually disturbs, we've already talked about it. This disturbs, uh, this actually has vagal stimulation and therefore leads to much better improvement, especially in hiccups. Uh, now, I won't be I if I didn't tell you uh, something ridiculous. Well, there is a Nobel Prize, which is called IG, Ig Nobel Prize, which is an opposite of Nobel Prizes, which honors achievements that make people laugh and then think. The prize is intended to celebrate the unusual, honor the imaginative, 
and spur people's interest in science, medicine, and technology. And in 2006, this gentleman, Fasmeyer FM, who is no small person, he's a professor in cardiology, he published a paper in 1988 for which they gave him the IG Nobel Prize, uh, is termination of intractable hip cups with digital rectal massage. Uh, again, he said that was stimulation, but more interestingly, and have a good laugh at it, Dr. Freismeyer, while collecting the IG Nobel Prize for a discovery said, he'd later realized that since then, that an orgasm would have the same effect and it might actually be preferred by patients. Both these medicines would gain and would again stimulate the vagus nerve. And therefore, have a good laugh, don't worry about it. The home remedies might work, might not work, but we can at least give them, give them a try. Just flatulence, well, flatulence is not just flatulence. The facts are we, we pass flatus a lot of times, we don't even know about it. And a lot of lifestyle modification, which I've already told you, helps out in reducing flatus. In these times of COVID-19, it would be foolish for me not to mention uh, anything, uh, relate COVID-19 uh, to farting. And uh, Dr. Tag has mentioned that, you know, they have found COVID-19 particles in feces. In 55%, he found feces. And in a podcast, Dr. Norman Swam, Swan, who was hosting it, said that could farts therefore independently spread infections because that's in the colon. Uh, well, uh, he warned that there should be no bare bottom farting. Now, I wonder uh, why somebody would in public do a bare bottom farting. But he also added that luckily we wear a mask from where the farts come out. And so therefore the public threat of farts in COVID-19 doesn't seem to be too high. And well, there's actually a literature that when you flush your toilet seat, if the person who has previously had a COVID-19 positive, the spray, the plume, the toilet plume, he called it, could actually contain the COVID virus. And therefore, when you next flush your toilet seat, shut it first and then plume it. Well, shutting the toilet seat reminds me that it's time for me to shut up and go on next to the question and answers. And I hope my little talk was good enough for you. You had a little smile on your face, which was good. And now I come to this picture. This is a gentleman that's farting on Van Gogh's face and Van Gogh's mask is hanging from one ear. It is because Van Gogh did this self-portrait, but because he had chopped off his ear in one of his uh, schizophrenic episodes, there's no other ear from which he can hang that mask. He's just got to tolerate somebody else's fart without having a mask to protect himself. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm done, sir. Okay, it's, uh, Dr. Tyagi, that was a very interesting talk. As usual, you put uh, art into every talk and uh, this was meant to be art of healing of uh, these symptoms, bloating and all. So something very interesting for the people, for the audience to brood over and question. You, I'm sure you are going to have a lot of questions. Uh, so I think with that, we start the question answer session. Dr. Tandon, uh, you have any, any comments to make before we start? I think that both Dr. Bhatt and Dr. Tyagi have highlighted one point very important, and that is this condition of in intestinal gas, bloating, hiccups, all this needs very good clinical evaluation. This is very important, not to jump on investigating every patient. First, evaluate how much of this you think is functional, how much is organic. I think this has been very well elucidated. A good clinical me method uh, has to be adopted first and then only investigate and then analyze what are, what is the specific problem. So that is one thing I would say. Secondly, I like to urge and emphasize that diet and 
physical activity that uh, Dr. Tyagi mentioned. I think these are essential components of any doctor's prescription. I think it's unjustified for any doctor to say, well, it's just because of lack of time, he does not devote enough time for uh, give, giving proper diet to the advice. I think that diet and doing some yoga or some physical exercise, these are very essential components of prescription. I think that prescription is incomplete if you have not done that. And thirdly, I'd just like to say that there are two other important uh, consideration pharmacotherapy that we uh, often use, albeit empirically, and that is Giardia is a very common <coughs> infection in our society. So it's uh, somebody who's having a lot of gas, bloat sensation, diarrhea. Sometimes we do empirically use uh, imidazole preparation for treating a Giardia, and there's nothing wrong in it if you have done two, three stool examinations. And I'm surprised that nobody mentioned about the stool examination, which I think absolutely essential. Two or three good stool examination by concentration method is absolutely necessary for any gastroenterologist when dealing with these functional diseases, especially gassy abdomen and, uh, and, and bloating and hiccups. Lastly, I like to say that lactose intolerance, again, everybody said it's very common. Please. It's not a good idea just to, uh, to abstain from advising milk, abstain from milk. It is better that we give lactase preparation. If you prove that, yes, avoiding milk does indeed uh, improve the symptoms, then I think it's best to give lactase enzyme and allow the person to take milk rather than abstaining it for life and keeping getting himself uh, calcium deficient. So that is the general recommendation now. And uh, black death preparation is freely available in India also and everywhere. So I think with that, uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers for excellent talk and we open the question and answer. And Rakesh, do you have some questions in front of you? Then you can start uh, yes, with that. Uh, yeah, why don't you? Uh, the, the first question is on Simethicone. Uh, Naresh, uh, Dr. Tannan had also talked of it. Yeah, you the, yeah, cybeticone has been shown to be useful, but the basic thing is that it's more useful in the upper tract and especially more during endoscopy and other procedures. But I didn't see too much of literature uh, used in cybeticone in controlling bloating. Most of them, when they use, they compared it with antibiotics or some probiotic and found that it was quite inferior. And that's why I didn't bring up. But then I guess you know, when you have a difficult patient, no harm trying it out. I'd agree with Professor Rakesh Tandon on that. All right. Uh, how many times can probiotics be, or the duration of probiotics, and uh, can they be repeated? The this probiotics, as I said, uh, well, I personally believe that it has a very little role, and I don't think it benefits much. So the question of continuous or repeated probiotics actually doesn't come up because probiotics are almost uh, useless uh, to manage any of these symptoms. Uh, then there's a question of uh, how do you taper rifeximin? Is it a uh, predefined period you give two weeks or? Yeah, yeah. 10, 10 to 14 days or 15 days you give it and then stop. There's no tapering required. You can use it uh, four to six weeks later, again, if need be, but which I don't like, but this is what you could do. But it's not, there's no tapering required. You can just stop it after. It's 400 BID or 550 BID? There are different uh, trials. There are 400 BD, 400 TID, 550 BD. There are different trials with this. And that's why I gave a kind of open uh, dosage uh, regime. Right. Uh, Dr. Tyagi, is there any correlation between menopause and malabsorption? Any, any? Menopause. I yeah. haven't. I, I didn't go into reading uh, that, and therefore I, 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 I don't think I can comment on it. Uh, but I really don't think there's a direct relationship. It's probably more age-related that this happens. Can I put in a word yeah. there? 
Uh, see, the one that we must understand that as we age, our gut also ages and our ability to handle a lot of foods does come down. So uh, flatulence does increase as you age. Your ability to handle of getting diarrhea once you eat out does come in uh, as you age. So I think it may sort of age reflect related. that rather than any hormonal association. It's, it's more age related, like I said. All right. Uh, why does a person get foul smelling fart when one eats a little, little more than normal? I mean, uh, part two can be ignored, but why constituents of a foul smell uh, fart? Uh, uh, yes. Anil. Yeah. I think uh, Anil will be. Yeah. Already yeah. told about that, but yes, you can expand about it. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Ultimate, the flatus production is directly related to, you see, I showed you that churning mill pot in which the exit from the colon, from the anus is dependent on what you are feeding to the bacteria in the colon. So more FODMAPs, as Dr. Uh, Tyagi has shown, oligosaccharides, primarily there is a number called DP number. That is a degree of polymerization. A oligogalactosides, oligosaccharides and non-resistant starch. These are the three major components which will be degraded by the bacteria and produce hydrogen. Now, once hydrogen is produced, if you have a sulfur-reducing bacteria, that is given preference over a methane-producing bacteria. So, if you have any diet which contains a lot of sulfur-containing food, as Dr. Tyagi has given you a list, including fruits and vegetables and the protein stuff, poultry stuff, then the preference is given not to the methane-producing bacteria plus to H2S-producing bacteria. So, if you eat more and if there is more supply to the hydrogen, uh, to sulfur-reducing bacteria, you will have more H2S. Now, H2S either can be absorbed and excreted in the kidney, it doesn't go out into the breath or can come out. So, if you have foul-smelling breath, Please take a course of uh, antibiotics for two weeks and reduce the sulfur-containing amount in the diet. The other uh, thing is that when you eat a lot of onion and garlic, uh, yes. that tends to produce more foul-smelling uh, flatus rather than uh, the other. In, in fact, cabbages so and cauliflower. In fact, it's, you know, there are so many other gases which can produce. This is methanol, pantamidine, so many other small gases which produce a uh, foul smelling component of which onion and garlic are one important component and the polyols. Polyols have double disadvantage. First of all, they can produce so much of the acid that they can even produce lactic acidosis as Dr. Uh, Tyagi has mentioned. And secondly, if you have too much of the gas which are produced in the colon, you will have more gas coming down the rectum. One, one other thing, Anil, one other thing I have seen that uh, the youngsters who go to gym and do bodybuilding, and they take a lot of uh, pro yes. high protein drinks. They tend to produce a lot of gas and foul spreading gas. I did mention very high protein diets uh, tend yeah. to have. Uh, right. Yes, I, I that have. Is most of the uh, cysteine is the most important source of sulfur containing items, and yes. cysteine is a part of the protein. That is the reason high protein yeah. diet, especially if it contains a lot of cysteine, will give you a foul smelling odor. Yes, uh, just to add to that, uh, many of these high protein supplements, there is a warning la label on the products that they can cause diarrhea also. I yes. have had a few patients who have actually lost weight uh, persistently even after stopping their exercise because they continue to consume those high protein supplements. So that, that the use of high protein supplements commercially available should be discouraged. You can have a homemade high protein diet instead of that. And uh, for the same thing, another observation which is common and understandable is uh, the packaged fruit juices. They're high in fructose and they are likely to produce uh, bloating and distension and all these symptoms. So the, the use of these fruit juices should be avoided. Yes, Dr. Plus, Tass yeah, plus they contain uh, sweetness. Yes. And, and you know, those preservative sweeteners, they yes, also yes. tend to cause more flatulence. Yes, yes. Uh, and they the have very high glycemic index. Amongst index. the sugar, yeah, amongst the sugar, the most tasty stuff is fructose. Yes. There is a competition between fructose and glucose at the level of the small intestine for absorption. 
So if both are high, fructose can be absorbed. But if glucose is high, fructose is never absorbed. So the more unabsorbed fructose go goes down into the colon, the more it is fermented, the more oh, gases are produced. Yes. So all, and I'm sure this is a good observation. Otherwise, as a clinician, that if you take a food item or juices which contain a lot of polyols or sweeteners like candies, chocolate, ice cream, they will have a lot of fructose. Which is not actively as well absorbed into the proximal small intestine by the GLUT4 mechanism because the GLUT4 receptors in the small intestine are pretty deficient for fructose as against glucose. Both of them are monosaccharides. So undigested fructose as a part of the sucrose or sweetener is the biggest troublemaker in the intestine. It is the biggest and, feeder for the remnant and, bacteria. And pancreatic enzymes do not tend to break them down rather easily. Right. I think because they need to have absorbed GLUT4. Dr. Tyagi, you mentioned about smoking. I think that was a very good point. But you missed out the alcohol. That also produces gas. And Beer, any I had mentioned irritated, irritated beverage, uh, they produce gas. I'm sorry, uh, if you did mention I'm I sorry, did I mention mean, beer in the study. I, I, I mentioned, yeah. Okay. So, irritated beverages, uh, alcohol, and smoking. These should be uh, to the bare minimum to avoid uh, gas. Yes, Dr. Hari, there is a question for you. Is abdominal EMG available anywhere? Uh, sir, there have been a few papers. One of the papers I've read from Jipmer uh, in Pondicherry. I think Jipmer has a facility for doing an abdominal EMG. Mm -hmm. Apart from this, I'm not aware of any other center as of now uh, which has abdominal EMG. Right. Uh, Naresh, any you, you had raised your hand? No, no. I just wanted to bring up the point about... Um, uh, dietary food supplements and protein supplements that going beyond two gram per kg per day actually has no benefit. So the this maximum you can go is two grams per day. Uh, so that's why out. excessive whey protein that they take the gym actually doesn't confer that much benefit. All right, right. The, the, you know, questions have disappeared from my chart. As somebody can tell that if the questions can come, I can see. But I remember one of the questions was in the same context as Dr. Kocher asked, uh, Shri Hari, that is to you, that how important it, it is to have assessed methane as well as uh, hydrogen. That is uh, That was the question. I know that I saw. I missed it now. So, sir, uh, uh, of all the people who are evaluated for hydrogen breath test, we can yeah. miss out on around 15 to 20 percent of the patients. Because these are the people who don't tend to produce hydrogen because their flora is different. They have more of methanogenic bacteria in the gut and they tend to produce methane or hydrogen. So it is very important that we test both hydrogen and methane in order to find out all the cases in case we can miss out uh, if we just do a hydrogen bread test and miss out on the methane content. Okay. Dr. Tiagi. Four molecules, as I had mentioned, four molecules of hydrogen get into one molecule of methane. Methane. So if you are just going by 20 ppm as the cutoff point of a raised hydrogen level over the breath level in patients who have methane producing bacteria, you will end up uh, misdiagnosing uh, bacterial overgrowth syndrome. So in that subgroup of the patient, if you measure both, then you have an answer that there is this evidence of SIBO. That is the advantage. Dr. Tyagi, uh, home remedies, you didn't touch much on that. Uh, raw, if you eat somf and clove. Ajwain. Ajwain, so, yes, yes. Uh, no, Naresh had already mentioned it. Food. Naresh had already mentioned it food that a lot food. of patients find benefit. There really is no data hmm. available uh, on these. And therefore, uh, patients who tend to benefit from these within limits can take uh, it. I had a lady. Uh, who started with, uh, you know, a half a teaspoon, but ultimately was taking a teaspoon of ajwain almost every hour. So, you know, it, 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 they can overdo these things thinking that everything is safe. I really have not read what ajwain contains and what it ultimately would do, but uh, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, some other textbooks or some other... Uh, uh, Ayurvedic journals would probably give us an idea about it. They're all minor irritants and so increase the peristalsis and help you to sort of vent the gas. Uh, just like asafoetida, which is a common part of cooking, at least in South India. Yes. Eno, Eno, this, uh, this very popular uh, 50 years ago, what about, still being consumed by some, I believe. 
Naresh, what do you say? It gives yes, a good uh, bump. Yeah, the thing is that it's good when you have upper GI symptoms after every mm -hmm. meal. It is acts as an antacid, does uh, bring down symptoms, and uh, as Dr. Tyagi said, you can you're able to burp and vent it out as well. It's essentially an antacid, nothing more than yes, that. Yes. And actually, you know, it doesn't reduce anything. It gives you a good burp, yes. and because there's already a perception in the patient's mind that if I burp out oh, loud, nice. I'll feel lighter. So it just reinforces his uh, impression because actually when you have this, it's actually creating its own gas inside, which the patient is burping out. It's not actually emptying out anything in addition, but it gives, you know, he's able to burp and he feels very light about he it. He is better. And you know, the, uh, you, my, some of my friends, yours too, would have said Pudin Hara. Pudin Hara has soda bicarbonate. It, it's available in liquid form and cap, capsule-like things. And uh, it does, you know, instantly provide you the same relief as... Uh, mint. Yes. It's mint. Peppermint. It's peppermint mint. is available as an expensive mint. substitute. So yeah. you can spend more money and get these mint capsules. Yes. But Pudin Hara is dirt cheap. Probably 5 rupees for 100 tablets, something like that. It contains very little in the quantity. Yes, yes. But that's good because otherwise it produces a lot of heartburn if you take larger yeah, quantities. Yeah, no, yeah. It's yes, one of yes. the problems with the peppermint oil capsules. That's right. Yeah. There are two questions, Rakesh, that I think that need to be uh, taken up. Yes. And they have come in front of me now. There is one, uh, Dr. Girish Patek from Jawalpur has asked, uh, if there, is, there are occasional casual hiccups on continuous once or twice hiccups or continuous hiccups, what is the difference between all these and are all of them pathogenic? Casual one or two hiccups and then a series of hiccups. That's the question I know. Yes. Anil? <clears throat> yeah. You see, uh, if you look at anything and everything, unless it is troublesome, has no meaning. If you look at the basic physiology of the flatus, burping, eructation, up to 20 times passage of the flatus per rectum is supposed to be normal. A normal person typically has around 300 ml of gas in the intestine, but it is a big range. If you look at the people after eating, how much they produce and measure it scientifically, up from 400 ml to 2500 ml, you may have a different accommodating capacity. So once in a while, hiccup has no meaning. The hiccup is a troublesome problem when it affects your routine, it requires medical attention. Then there are three ways of looking at it, whether it is a continuous, troublesome, requires doctor's attention. If it is acute or chronic, and most of the time acute is related to the stress or reflux, which settles down with anti-anxiety medication or PPI, that is the best way. Yeah, as Dr. Naresh Bhatt said, if you just do an endoscopy on the patient with a troublesome hiccup, nine out of the time, time they will either have reflux or because of the act of endoscopy and PPI, the patient will be better. But the troublesome is chronic persistent hiccups. In fact, there is a case in the literature. This is a story of Charles Osborne who had hiccups for 96 years at a stretch. I don't know whether Dr. Rakesh Tandon will remember when we were posted during our internship in PSM in Balabgad. This was a rural area. Then Dr. Nandi was our preceptor who would take us on the rounds. So when we went to the Balabha near a remote village near the Yamuna, he went to a big sadhu, you know, just to ask one question, what is the treatment for intractable hiccups? Well, at that stage, as professor of surgery in Ames, <laughs> we didn't have anything to offer. Forget about Prenik now, uh, <laughs> resection and all. So intractable hiccups, I remember, I remember. from that. So that is what causes that. the problem. Yeah. Today we know it is a myoclonic contraction of the left diaphragm. Unless you interrupt the arc, either at the level of the afferent, central level or uh, efferent level, it will never settle down. But most of the time, it is either idiopathic, stress-induced, reflux-induced. <laughs> and if you are, you are not able to find the answer, please look into the central cause. GI tract, we can easily look into by simple endoscopy. But central cause is something, hyponatremia, diselectolatremia, central lesions are important causes which need to be ruled out. Because in this era of medical legal problem, I think as a gastroenterologist, we should not miss out a central lesion, which may just be saying it is a functional or those related to reflux. See, another question, Rakesh, I'd like to 
highlight here. I'm surprised that somebody has asked because this issue is almost settled. What is the role of gallstone disease in causation of dyspepsia? Does cholecystectomy relieve dyspeptic symptoms? Has the incident of dyspepsia increased or we are more, uh, more demanding of the medical profession? Anyway, I think the issue of dyspepsia and gallstone disease is well settled. There is no relationship. There may be patients with gallstones may have dyspepsia, but cholecystectomy is not going to relieve dyspepsia. So that should be, I think that point is very clear, uh, but somebody has asked that. Yeah, can, okay. can I comment on that? Yeah. You see, we as gastroenterologists believe that dyspepsia is not part of the gallstone disease, but uh, talk to any surgeon. They don't think gallstones can ever be asymptomatic. I'm sure there are hundreds of debates, Dr. Rakesh Kochard and Dr. <laughs> Bhatwil Eli, who have had multiple debates on asymptomatic gallstones should be operated or not. But if a patient with gallstones ever goes to a surgeon, the first thing is he will advise lab coli because he thinks the reason patient has come to him is because he's symptomatic. That they don't believe there is something called dyspepsia. All gallstones they need to operate. And then once the patient continues to have dyspepsia after surgery, he says, Ki mera to kaam ho gaya, go back to the patient. <laughs> they are looking for a reason, reason to operate. <laughs> And then yes. you got dyspepsia. So yeah, yeah. Yes. Sir, what what, are, what Anil is saying basically is if this patient went to a to a yoga instructor, he would advise him yoga. So if he you know where he goes is what he's going to be uh, he's going to be advised is, is depending on the speciality and what the person has to the has barber to chair offer. phenomenon. The barber chair <laughs> phenomenon. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Nandi used to say that when a carpenter goes with a hammer and a nail, he's got to find out somewhere to stick the nail in. Yes, Rakesh, go ahead. Yeah, there's, a yes. there's a beautiful song, I'd rather be a hammer than a nail. <laughs> okay. Yes, Rakesh. Yeah, there are no more questions, it seems. Uh, yeah, and we, we've exceeded the time as well. Yes, yes, we... Okay. Get back to Anil Aroda for uh, summing up. Yeah. Uh, two you. comments regarding Dr. Uh, Tyagi's yeah. uh, presentation. First of all, he showed the red flags for psychological diagnosis. I think they should really? be changed to green flags. So this is what a green flag. flag. You are so green. confident. <laughs> it should be green flag, not the red flag. Red flag is also a warning. So you are so confident it's a psychological problem. Please change the, that flag to green. Second I think it's a very, very problem. good suggestion. <laughs> very good suggestion. <laughs> I, I, I accept Second that suggestion, but I'm not problem. accepting. Yeah. I accept uh -huh. that suggestion, but I'm not accepting your next uh, proposal that I deliver that talk again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and secondly, okay. my proposal from Daily Liver Foundation and all the big wigs in this panel is we should recommend Dr. Tyagi for IG Nobel Prize at least. Thank you all. Right. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all very Thank much. You. We had a very nice it's day. Wonderful. Very nice. Hopefully and a very important nice topic day. covered. And then I must congratulate you, congratulate you yes, for indeed. selecting this topic because this is something that is not often discussed but of utmost importance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Thank Yagi, you. Dr. Rakesh, thank you. Dr. Thank Nare, you. Dr. Hari. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I'm extremely thankful to the support by the Zydus for uh, this uh, academic yes. activity. Yeah. Thank, thank you so great. much. Wonderful. Oh, ready. Bye-bye.